As this lore series is solely concerned with the Witchers themselves and not the wider universe they inhabit, we will be going over a severely abridged summary of the universe in question to orient ourselves within it. If you're familiar with the multiverse of Stephen King's writings or the concept of the Eternal Champion by Michael Moorcock, then the concept of infinite parallel universes isn't new to you and is indeed a great writing choice when engaging in fantasy or horror to better represent the subconscious of the human mind inherent to both genres. One very clear Stephen King reference is the character Gunter Dim, whose name and various powers resemble the reoccurring character in many Stephen King works known as Walter Odim in The Dark Tower, as well as a seemingly limitless number of other aliases as he travels through various universes and Stephen King stories. If you've played the expansion Heart of Stone for The Witcher 3, you'll know that Gunter is a character that seems limitless in power, only truly being able to be defeated by being beaten at his own game or rules that he himself sets up. This concept of a full rejection of an entity, which many consider to be the center of evil or the devil himself, by overcoming a mental challenge, is how many Stephen King villains such as the evil clown spirit from It is defeated. The chief multiversal event in the Witcher universe is the universe-on-universe -universe collision called the Conjunction of Spheres. 1,500 years ago, from the modern time period, this would bring the various monsters and extremely supernatural creatures we know of today into what was previously as best described as an as-low fantasy world as one could get when already having races like elves, halflings, lizardmen called Vran, beast people called Werbub, and dwarves in them. The youngest race, man, was displaced along with all of these, except while others would see their populations dwindle or be nearly wiped out over the centuries, man would grow to become the vast majority of most, if not all, known lands. The people of the northern kingdoms, consisting of the German-reminiscent Kedwin, Poland-reminiscent Rodenia, France-reminiscent Temeria, and many other European S cultures, are collectively referred to as Nordlings. Many kings of the different Nordling cultures 300 years ago from the start of the Witcher games or books decided that monsters, as defined by their negative relationship with men, needed a specialized group of magic knights to handle them. The criteria for the Nordling definition of monsters is firstly dissimilarity to humans, secondly is lack of obvious sentient intelligence. The effort to create this group of magic knights when leaving the world of theory and entering practical implementation would manifest in the Order of Witchers. The name Witcher is reminiscent of the origins of the word Christian in our world. Long before the term was associated with the religion, the term Christian was a Latin slur for followers of Jesus Christ, translating to Little Christ, the cultural context of the time being the perceived execution of their would-be King of Kings. The term Witcher, in a similar bent, was a slur from mages who oversaw the first experiments to try and turn men into these perceived idealistic magic knights, only to get what they called charlatans only capable of witchery. The cultural context being that witchery effectively means weak magic and can be considered synonymous with low status or abomination among mages and sorcerers, which could also be considered the beginning of social problems inherent to being a witcher. However, there was one mage who would not give up on the witchers, without whom the term would never become synonymous with the professional monster hunters we know of today. His name was Alzor, who, alongside his master and his disciple, would perfect the trials and mutations that young boys would be subjected to, altering them so drastically that those who survived the horrid process would be considered an entirely separate race from humanity. This process was harsh, and it is said that all girls and most boys who went through it had died, leaving only five children to grow into to the first generations of true witchers. This would also start the general trend that only able-bodied boys would be chosen for the process. Very soon, their original knightly codes would be heavily altered by splinter groups, along with the order of witchers splitting off into various witcher schools, training recruits to take a more practical scientific stance towards monster slaying. This allows for both better results in the field, of course, of monster slaying, and economic gain on the part of the Witchers. While the books and Netflix show only have one Witcher school as canon, the School of the Wolf, many people, including myself, consider the most interesting additions to the lore by CD Projekt Red to be multiple Witcher schools, each with their own subculture. The School of the Griffin are closest to the desired original Witcher experiment, being skilled in diplomacy and magic. 
The School of the Cat has trademark extreme emotions, which is held in extreme contrast to the professional stoicism of the School of the Wolf Witchers. Lastly, the School of the Viper also became assassins for hire, and the School of the Bear, now wiped out, specialized in fighting the giant monsters of the North, thus were very heavy weapon focused, which is rare for the usually light to medium armored race. Whether you're a wolf trained at the ruined castle of Kaer Morhen, or a cat trained by the nomadic caravan of Denmarv, your path has only just begun. One thing I really want you to think about as we're studying this lore with that idea of the magic knight who then when he leaves the world of theory and then is tried to be actually created becomes something that everyone hates but actually in that state of being something that everyone hates does a better job than the idealistic thing at the beginning. If you remember our first video on this universe, then you'll remember that I talked about The Witcher being fantasy noir, meaning that it very specifically has this view of, hey, if you go out and try to be an idealistic hero and not understand the social situations and world that you're in, then you'll probably do more harm than good. It's a lot like if you took that mentality in real life. But if you find a niche to fill and you are responsible and integrate yourself within a civilization or within an economy or within a lifestyle, becoming a well-balanced human being, then you will actually be able to not only benefit others, but also yourself. And that's one of the key messages I feel is very present in The Witcher. Idealism isn't always good, but when tempered with realism, when those ideals and those passions are tempered with extreme realism, they can do good in the world. It just won't be in the flashy, magical way that a child imagines, but, like noir is very prone to do, it'll be in the morally ambiguous world of adults.